Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, transmission of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And our guest today is Eric Zygman, uh, Executive Director of the Golden Gate Regional Center. But before we begin with our guest, Will, you normally wear a very interesting t-shirt. Could you show our viewers that and tell us about it? This week's shirt is is my best buddy shirt. I, I'm 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 wearing it to support best buddies. Last week I went went to the I went to the annual Best Buddies Gala at the Intercontinental Hotel. It's an award show and and an auction. And this year we honored our new Best Buddies champions for the year. Thank you to all who to all who supported Best Buddies and went to the gala. Excellent. And and Best Buddies has been uh, closely associated with Ascend for a very long time, and we are very glad for its continued success. Tell us about the Golden Gate Regional Center. Well, thanks, Will. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for Ascend for inviting me today. Um, Golden Gate Regional Center started over 55 years ago um, as one of the first two regional centers in the pilot project for the state that launched the Regional Center and the Lannerman Act system. The Lannerman Developmental Disabilities Services Act is an entitlement that's unique in the nation. It's the only civil rights, social justice, entitlement in, um, in the United States. And it basically says that every person with a developmental disability um, is, deserves services to help them sort of live, learn, work, and play, to be supported in what they need and what they wanna do in life, what they aspire to. So Golden Gate was one of the first two regional centers. One was in Los Angeles, one was in San Francisco, and it has grown over those uh, 55 years to be serving 10,000 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in San Mateo, San Francisco, and Marin counties um, with a staff of about 235 people, most of them social workers, but not all. Um, and they, we do what the state is in state law, which is to have those individual planning meetings that turn into support for people again, to live, learn, work, and play. And so it, it's a place to live, it's a, a job or something to do during the day that's meaningful for you. And um, it's really trying to, you know, trying to live the best life you can and, and having us help um, support that life. So um, it's a little challenge at Golden Gate. The other thing um, over our three counties is they're the most expensive counties in California, probably very close to the most expensive in the country. Um, so that, that creates particular challenges, but we still do whatever we can to serve the 10,000 people who qualify for services. Tell us about your background in the disability field. Thanks, Will. It's a really good question. Um, I started a long time ago in 1989 in direct service in a sheltered workshop in Santa Cruz, California. And that was my somewhat my introduction to the whole world of disabilities and the subculture of people with disabilities. And so it was for me life changing in that um, just being in support of people was really, um, really gratifying and really helpful. And I learned so much from the people I served right away. And then um, over 15 years, we closed that workshop and got almost everyone jobs in the community. It took a long time, it took a lot of work, um, but it was very exciting to see 100 people working at jobs in the community, making much more money than they could in the workshop, and just having, um, just having more you know, diverse and fulfilled kind of lives. So um, that was really important to me. And then I really concentrated on work programs um, until I started running that whole agency, which had a lot of different programs. Respite for kids with autism was one of our programs, day programs, um, the work programs I've mentioned, and uh, supported living, which we got into very early in the mid 90s, which was a blessing and, and really showed us a better way to support people where they could hire and fire their own staff and really tell us and train staff really tell us better about what they needed. Um, and then for the next two decades, I played a role with about 44 different projects because I was a consultant. It was all in developmental disabilities, most in the Bay Area. Um, 
And after that, I, I had the blessing of working with regional centers, still as a consultant, to close big state institutions. Agnews Developmental Center down in San Jose and moving 300 folks, supporting them to move into new lives in the community rather than live in an institution. Um, and then when I got to Golden Gate Regional Centers six and a half years ago, we were in the process of supporting people to move out of Sonoma Developmental Center, the oldest developmental center, something like 115 years old, but it didn't give people a chance to really live the life they wanted to live. So it was a blessing too to be part of that where 150 people that Golden Gate Regional Center supports moved from this institution into communities, most almost all into our three counties and they got to do stuff that they hadn't, weren't able to do at the institution, like swim in a public swimming pool or join a stamp club or um, get a job or live somewhere where they could volunteer and walk into downtown um, and just get to be known as full community members. So that's my background. I've been here six and a half years and of course over 35 years of um, being in support of people with disabilities. There's a lot more, but I think those are the highlights for me. So the executive director of um, a regional center is interesting. It, regional centers aren't government institutions or not part of the state government. They're nonprofit organizations. And the difference is the government has a whole structure where Sacramento um, dictates and controls the services. So if you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles or if you go to the Department of Rehabilitation, those are state agencies and local, and they have local offices. The difference for regional centers, and Golden Gate's one of 21 regional centers, I should have mentioned that. The difference is for regional centers is they're nonprofits. So I have a board of directors um, and that board of directors are volunteers from the community, many, connected with the system, meaning uh, many either have a developmental disability or their parents or family members of someone we serve. Um, that nonprofit board is my boss. They hire and, and tell me whether I'm doing a good job. They help plan for the future of the agency and what we call strategic planning. We create a plan of where we wanna go at Golden Gate. And it's really different than being part of a government agency. Having said that, we get almost all of our $500 million from the government. So they have a lot of requirements in law and in contracts. They, they demand a lot of us, but at, at the very root, at the basis, regional centers are community facing. And so the executive director's role is really to work with the board of directors to run the agency in the way um, we feel like it should be run to try to support the people we serve the best we can. And so they hire me, basically, the board of directors, and then I'm responsible for all the other staff. And I have a team of five senior directors that help with social work and community development and clinical services and human resources um, uh, and, and uh, those kind of things. So. Um, my job is really to be sort of the, the main staff member, the one that's responsible for everything that goes on in the agency. So I have to have a lot of trust relationships with, with people. And my job is to try to um, create an organization where our staff can do their best work. We now have a few questions from uh, Jennifer Brooks, our book correspondent. Yes, Eric, thank you very much for giving us your time today. I'd like to ask a few questions. How does someone qualify for services from the regional center and how do they access those services? Is there a waiting list? There is, what is the average waiting time? And also what besides autism falls under the umbrella of a developmental disability? And what if a person has more than one diagnosis? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I appreciate both of those questions. And I, again, appreciate being here today to talk with you. Um, to qualify for regional center services, it's in the Lanterman Act law. And um, individuals have to go through our intake process. And there's assessments from usually a number of clinicians 
um, to be able to see where someone qualifies. It's very specific in the law around definitions of what's called substantial disability in a number of areas. There's no waiting list because it is an entitlement. Everyone who qualifies is, um, is taken into the system. And interestingly, like, unlike other systems, it's not time limited. Once you qualify, once you're eligible for Lanterman Act services, it's a lifelong entitlement as long as you need it um, or want it. So um, the person would go to our website and look for the intake button. And then there's a form to fill out that would start the process. We have also in law a certain number of days, I believe it's 120 days overall to move through a process to determine whether someone is eligible. And then um, a social worker is assigned and the person's initial individual program plan, which is that meeting that tries to really talk with somebody and hear about what the support they would need to do what they want in life and to be safe and to be happy. And then to try to find those um, support and often support services, whether they're regional center funded services like programs or um, things like in-home support services or special education services or Medi-Cal. And we can help with a lot of um, connections to services that we don't necessarily fund, that, but people also deserve support from. And then in terms of your other question about who qualifies um, for services, there's five different categories. Um, and that's evolved in the first, I think, 10 to 15 years of the system, um, but they've stayed the same uh, for decades now. And those five categories are someone with an intellectual disability, which is a, co a cognitive processing measure um, about uh, how quickly people take in information and are able to, to digest it. Cerebral palsy, which is a physical condition that happens at birth. Epilepsy, which I think um, is more well-known where people have seizures. Uh, autism which Ascend has a particular interest in, I know, and, and, and is what we now also refer as neurodiversity. So autism is part of the definition. Not all people with autism qualify for regional center services because um, they need to uh, have to go through the um, assessments that show that areas of how, how substantial um, the autism is in, uh, in affecting their lives. And so there is a fifth category, which is called the fifth category. And it's defined as someone who needs services similar to someone with intellectual disabilities, but there may not be a diagnosis of uh, an intellectual disability. Uh, so those, those are the, the categories of service. That's our intake and assessment process. Um, you also had a great question about what if someone has epilepsy and autism or cerebral palsy and intellectual disability. Um, and that happens frequently that um, you, you can have one or more of these conditions. And if um, once you go through the eligibility assessments, it's determined um, whether you're eligible for regional center services. And so um, we, we see people with um, who could be categories in many of the categories and really try to look, the whole system is built on looking at each person as an individual and not, not getting stuck on what their disability is as much as understanding who they are. So once people become eligible for services um, in those initial planning meetings, what we call the IPP, the Individual Program Plan, that's the place what makes our system unique is it looks at each person individually and doesn't say you get only these four or five services and you only get this amount, we look at each person individually and say, because this is a state entitlement to services, what do you need as an individual to, again, have a safe and healthy life, but also pursue your dreams and, and figure out what you want to do in the world and um, with your life and, and how Regional Center can support you doing that. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Eric, uh, a couple of questions. You had earlier on had uh, mentioned the uh, 
briefly about the type of services that a uh, regional center provides for clients. Could you elaborate more on what those uh, involve? In other words, could you give us, our viewers, some details regarding those services? Absolutely, Keith, thanks for asking. This is an area that also is different than other kind of human service um, agencies. Because we were developed as nonprofit to meet individual and local needs, we, over the 55 years of development, regional centers have a lot of different services that we fund ourselves. Again, we try to help connect people to services that's already there in the community, but we also serve hundreds, we have hundreds and hundreds of different service codes. And so they range wildly from clinical services like occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, behavior support, to um, home services that are, include group homes, but they also include people living in their own apartments with what we call independent living services support or supported living services support. There's residential or home living services called family home agency supports where an individual lives with a family and gets support from both the family and from the family home agency um, to do what they wanna do in the world. And then there's lots of services that we call non-residential, not home services that are about, does someone want to get a job? Do they want to volunteer somewhere? Do they want to be in a program that works on communication with uh, other people? Uh, do they want to um, have a, experiences in the community, go kayaking or take a trip somewhere? Um, so those services sometimes are called employment day services, day program services, and they continue to evolve over the decades and, and look differently. Um, there's a new one called Taylor Day Services that's not new exactly, but got expanded in the last California Budget Act. Um, and so we're looking forward to that service, helping people, again, you know, have a lot of attention of not just, do you wanna join this program, but what do you wanna do as an individual? and how can we um, support you? And so um, they are, for a long time, there were not social recreation programs, they were called. We were forbidden by law. We couldn't fund those services. And in the um, last budget cycles, we've been able to start reestablishing those. So you'll start to see more of those and hopefully more creative ways of working with local parks and rec and local resources to to enhance their services uh, and make them make sure they're welcoming to people with all kinds of disabilities, uh, including regional center, um, the people we serve at regional centers. So those are just some of the services, as I said, there's hundreds of them um, and they've evolved over the year based on community needs and individual needs, which is unique to our system that we can start new services um, based on what people are telling us would help them in their lives. Excellent, and thank you. Um, uh, my, my next question is, um, many of the people in our SEND community are profoundly affected by their autism. In other words, it greatly impacts their ability to flourish in a broader sense. However, they are not able to qualify for the regional center. And do you have any recommendation as to what they should do, uh, where they should go for assistance? Yeah, thank you, Keith. It's a question we grapple with for, for as long as I've been in the, in the field. I, I think I said I've served and supported people with disabilities since 1989. When I started, um, people with autism in those categories, Jennifer asked about people with autism were a much smaller part of our system. They were about 10 to 12% of all the people we serve. So one out of 10 people um, was a person with autism. And now it's triple that. It's in the 30s to almost 40%. Um, so it is changing in terms of our services, in terms of who we serve and, and sort of what each person um, looks like. It is difficult. I mean, our, our services were set up and it's very clear in the law that we're a system that was set up around intellectual disability. 
Now, intellectual disability used to be called mental retardation back in the old days, we call it. <laughs> and we don't like to use that phrase. And I certainly don't find it a respectful phrase, but just for the history of the system, that's, um, that's what the system was created around. And it had to do with how someone develops until they're the age of 22 and how their um, disability affects that. So um, it, it's grounded in that, and that's where those definitions and the eligibility and intake process come from. But we know there's thousands, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people with autism who go through that process and aren't able to um, be deemed eligible for services. Again, because not because we're trying to stop anyone, but because we have to follow the law and, and the process of eligibility. So for people who um, are neurodiverse and have autism, but don't, do not qualify for regional center services, um, we don't have a lot of control over the, the services, but certainly centers for independent living are charged with serving everyone with a disability. Um, there's groups you know, that still people qualify if they have a disability for Department of Rehabilitation Services. Um, so we do our level best to be able to refer people to other agencies that can serve them. And we do have a, you know, we, we have a appeals process that anyone who goes through the process of eligibility or well, eligibility and is not deemed eligible can avail themselves of an appeal process. And there's a whole bunch of steps um, around that. Um, that appeal process also happens when you do qualify for regional center services and you're, you feel like you're not getting what you need from us. And, and it's a good, a good process that helps us have a way to listen again to someone and see if there's anything um, we can do or do differently, either in eligibility or services. So I hope that answered the question. Oh, very much so. And, and it must be very frustrating uh, for you and your staff to find all the people that you would like to be able to assist but aren't able to because of the requirements. Absolutely. And it's heartbreaking sometimes as well as frustrating that we can't serve everyone with every with different kinds of disabilities. And, and really, I guess the other thing I would say, and Ascend is probably in a really good position for this, is all of this comes from state law and state law can be changed. And so advocacy with the people who make the laws, our legislators, senators, and assembly members is really the best way if you feel like um, it's not fair or more people should be included in regional center services, um, we will be happy to include them. We just need the state law to change to allow us to do it so that we stay on, we wanna stay on the right side of the law. It's, it's part of our, um, you know, charge. It's part of what we have to do. Thank you. Th this is very enlightening, encouraging. Also, speaking of decision makers, I think my final question for now is, what do you see as the future of people in the disability community taking more leadership roles uh, within the various regional centers? Thanks, Keith. Yes, um, I'm, I feel like it's very important, and our board of directors at Golden Gate Regional Center feels it's very important. It's part of our new strategic plan to try to be better about helping people who are have what they call a lived experience, have the you know people we're serving, we respect each individual and what their services is are, what their needs are, their aspirations, what they want to do in life. Um, but we want to do a better job in helping the people we serve be leaders and speak directly um, for themselves around what kind of world they want, what kind of system they want, what kind of support they want from um, the state and from regional centers. And so that can take a lot of different forms, but we're hoping to develop the leaders on our board of directors. We have four, usually four to five individuals we serve on our board of, of 10 to 15 directors. And also in our staff are, you know, we want to hire more people with disabilities who have that experience, who can talk to people out of that experience. You know, our system historically came from a very medical, what they call a medical model, where people with disabilities just listened to um, the people who were doctors and then human service people about what they needed. And that's changed. And we are doing a much better job of listening people to people who have a disability 
to listening to let them be experts on their own lives and tell us what they need. I think this is the next step to have more leaders um, with disabilities in all parts of our organization and the, and the community. Hello, everyone. This is your book correspondent, Jennifer Brooks. I'm happy to announce that I recently started a new job at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And one of the things the Hoover Institution does is publish books on a variety of subjects, none of which are related to autism spectrum disorders, but they do publish books on the topic of education. And today I would like to tell you you about one of those books. It is called Failing Our Brightest Kids by two authors, Chester E. Finn Jr., one of whom was a senior fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution in 2015 when this book was published, and Brandon L. Wright is a managing editor and policy associate at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. So as most of us who have ever attended a public school in America know, there is an obsession with test scores and at least 90% of the attention goes to kids who get low test scores, which leaves very, very little or absolutely nothing for the kids who get high test scores, which will come as a surprise to nobody who's on the autism spectrum. The high test scoring group includes many children and students who are on the autism spectrum. And it is the high test scoring group of students that this book, one of the only books of its kind, if not the only book, is shining a spotlight on. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't pay attention to kids with low test scores. Yes, we should. Their needs should be met, but so should the needs of high test scoring children. There are moral reasons why this is true. There are also economic reasons. Thank you very much, Jennifer. We'll now hear from our cultural correspondent, Stacey Kennedy. Hi, everybody. Uh, today, what I'd like to share is there's this thing, or I don't want to just call it a thing, but every Sunday, there's this crafting happy hour that happens on Zoom. Uh, each week, it will be a time of like creative crafting with materials around your house. And Teresa from Sweaty, she is in charge of all this. You can email her at the info at autismsociety.org. Autism Society uh, shares a lot of great, uh, fun events, and so. And just to uh, just just to skip and save you the trouble, uh, the ID for Zoom is three one seven nine four seven two eight eight four, and the passcode two two seven two. Six, three. Again, this is every Sunday on Zoom Crafting Happy Hour. Next is a Fan Expo that's happening uh, November 25th to 27th in San Francisco at the Moscone Center. And a lot of people in the community I know, including myself and those love to go to these things where you will ultimate there's these well there's this ultimate package there's this three-day package or if you just want involved in one event you want to see then you'll have to go to the site um but um it's a place to celebrate all things with pop culture and you can get autographs from your favorite celebrity or so uh photos and there's favorite guesses there's panels and um so yeah, that is Fan Expo happening November 25th to 27th at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. Thank you again, Stacy, uh, for your cultural work. Well, folks, that's about it for this week. Uh, until next time, which will probably be after Thanksgiving, so we're wishing you all a happy Thanksgiving season. I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Stacey Kennedy. I'm Jennifer Brooks. And I'm Eric Sigmund. And we're uh, Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. Take care, everyone. <laughs>